Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Brandon Winchester, and we are streaming live here today from the Andrews Institute, uh, where I'm the Regional Anesthesia Fellowship Director. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of BlockJocks.com, uh, which is an ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia education website. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about ultrasound-guided adductor canal nerve blocks. Just to give a little bit of background about myself, uh, I understand that we'll have viewers not only from around the United States, where I'm from, uh, but actually some multi-specialty physicians and nurses uh, from around the world. Uh, so I figured I'd let you know, you know a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, I'm from the western United States, the state of California. Uh, I grew up actually in central California in Sacramento. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that, it's sort of nestled nicely about an hour and a half from San Francisco in one direction, an hour and a half from Lake Tahoe in the other direction. Beautiful place to grow up. I uh, finished uh, high school there and went on to UCLA, which is in the southern part of California in Los Angeles. Uh, did my undergraduate studies at UCLA. Uh, later on, went to the University of Virginia Medical School. So I basically crossed all the way across the country here uh, into Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, which is a very small town, beautiful place to go to school. Uh, got my MD there and then ultimately finished my anesthesia training and did my anesthesia residency at Massachusetts General Hospital up in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and then ultimately completed my anesthesia training at Duke University School of Medicine. Uh, and that's certainly where I learned all the ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia uh, that we'll talk about today in this lecture. Uh, I worked at Duke for a few years after graduating, uh, but now I work at what I consider to be a dream job uh, here at the Andrews Institute. We're zooming out in that video clip there, uh, and you can see what an incredible place this is. It's surrounded by water. Uh, it's, a, from a professional standpoint, a perfect place for, for me to work. Uh, it's an eight operating room ambulatory surgery center. Uh, we have two anesthesiologists, myself and Dr. Greg Hickman, uh, supervising anesthetists in a care team model. Uh, and we also have a regional anesthesia fellow, one per year that comes and learns ultrasound-guided techniques like we'll talk about today uh, for a year. Uh, we do about 3,000 ultrasound-guided nerve blocks each year, and about half of those or more uh, are continuous perineural catheter techniques. Uh, so it's a, it's a fantastic place to work professionally and geographically a fantastic place to live as well. This is our, our town of Gulf Breeze, Florida, which is a nice peninsula here you can see in the video clip which I've paused. Uh, the Andrews Institute is here. I actually live right here, right on the, uh, the point of Gulf Breeze, right next to the water, uh, the sound. Uh, my kids go to school here, right in the, in the same little five minute block. Uh, and when people come and take courses at the Andrews Institute, they actually cross this bridge to Pensacola Beach and stay right there. So it's a, a beautiful place to live. And if I zoom out a little bit further, especially for those of you who aren't from the United States, you can see that actually, despite being in Florida, we're actually quite northwest. You can see this familiarity of Florida here. Tampa, Florida, and Naples, and Miami, and Fort Lauderdale are all down south Florida. We're in the way northwest part of Florida, the, uh, uh, the panhandle, so to speak. And we're actually in the central time zone as opposed to the eastern time zone, uh, for those of you who are ever uh, trying to figure out what time to call us. Uh, and so it's actually a fantastic place to live and work. Uh, and if you can zoom out a little bit further, you can actually see some real perspective uh, as to where the Andrews Institute is uh, relative to the rest of you guys out there. So we'll go ahead and get started. Our outline today is simple. Uh, we're going to be talking about ultrasound guided adductor canal nerve blocks. Uh, we'll talk initially about the anatomy. Uh, we'll talk about the indications for this technique. We'll talk about the evidence for adductor canal blocks uh, by presenting one of the landmark studies uh, that really got us all interested in this technique uh, way back when, uh, comparing adductor canal blocks to femoral nerve blocks for major knee surgery. Uh, and then we'll move on to the techniques. We're going to show you some video clips using our sonicide ultrasound uh, for both our single injection technique as well as our continuous catheter technique uh, for adductor canal blocks. So before we get into that, I did want to just briefly touch on the evolution of analgesia for major knee surgery. Uh, dating back to the early 90s, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of regional anesthesia being used at a lot of centers for major knee surgeries like total knee replacements and, and ACL reconstructions. Uh, and in fact, many patients would have nothing but maybe a general anesthetic, anesthetic or a spinal uh, and then be given an IV PCA button to use on the hospital ward. Uh, and it wasn't until kind of the 90s and early 2000s that uh, central regional anesthesia, neuraxial blocks like a combined spinal epidural or an epidural infusion uh, became popular. And people would typically stay for several days in the hospital with their epidural. Uh, as we evolved further into the 2000s, it came to be realized that a femoral nerve block 
uh, provided similar analgesia to the more neuraxial, the more central nerve blocks like epidurals. Uh, and then ultimately, as late as the mid to late 2000s, uh, people started putting in continuous femoral catheters, uh, which were found to have similar analgesia to that femoral nerve block, but prolonged the duration by several additional days. Uh, and now if you fast forward to the present, uh, we've discovered, as we'll talk about today, uh, that an optimal way to give patients uh, analgesia but also spare their quadricep muscles is to give them an adductor canal catheter uh, plus or minus a tibial nerve block. And we do tibial nerve blocks in addition to our adductor canal catheters for our major knee surgeries. Uh, today, however, we'll just focus on the adductor canal blocks and the adductor canal catheters. So just starting with the anatomy, and we'll get into some video clips and some images here in a little bit, but I just wanted to focus on two key landmarks. Uh, and I think whenever you're doing an ultrasound-guided nerve block, it's always important not just to know where the nerve targets are, uh, but to know where specific uh, landmarks are that guide your way. Uh, and in this particular example, like with many other nerve blocks, which are relatively straightforward and easy to perform, uh, an arterial landmark really helps guide us. The femoral artery is something that we'll show images and video clips of uh, to help guide you and, and, and determine that you are, in fact, in the correct location to do this nerve block. Uh, the sartorius muscle is probably the most important muscular landmark when doing an adductor canal block. And it's important not only to identify the sartorius muscle, but to clearly identify, based upon the tilting of your probe, the bright, deep border of the sartorius muscle, which will look sort of like a horizontal white line across the screen. So remember the key landmarks, sartorius muscle and femoral artery. Now, some additional anatomy to give you some background. Uh, when you're considering the adductor canal, you're thinking about a compartment that runs in the thigh parallel to the leg uh, that is essentially a triangular compartment. There's three particular muscle boundaries to remember. Uh, the one that I already mentioned, the key muscular boundary, is the sartorius muscle, which lies on the medial side of the adductor canal in that middle third of the thigh. Uh, the second muscular boundary is the vastus medialis muscle. That lies on the anterior lateral component of the uh, adductor canal. And then lastly, the adductor longus uh, muscle that is the posterior boundary of the adductor canal. Uh, now, if you take it a step further, uh, as an alternative to considering the adductor longus as a boundary, actually the femoral vein and the artery are typically what you'll visualize really as that third boundary. So from a visual standpoint, as we'll show you in a little bit, the sartorius and vastus medialis, in addition to the femoral artery and vein, are the main landmarks that you actually, from a, from a visual standpoint, will appreciate as your boundaries uh, when trying to target uh, your needle tip location in the correct adductor canal location. Now within the adductor canal, in addition to the femoral artery and the femoral vein, uh, are several near nerve branches that we should uh, remember. Uh, the first of which is the saphenous nerve. Uh, the second of which is the nerve to vastus medialis. And the third of which, which we'll talk about with, with, with variable importance, is the posterior division, the posterior branch of the obturator nerve. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of each of those in just a moment here. Uh, focusing first on the actual innervation pattern of each of the nerves, starting with the saphenous nerve. Now the saphenous nerve, we can consider it having essentially knee innervation and having below the knee innervation. Now from a, from a knee standpoint, although for years it wasn't particularly widely understood uh, that the saphenous nerve actually had major contributions to the knee, uh, then it actually does uh, have an anterior lateral skin innervation below the patella, and it actually does innervate in particular the joint capsule at the anterior inferior portion of the knee. Uh, now below the knee, and this is where you more traditionally think of a saphenous nerve innervation, uh, it innervates the skin and soft tissue of both the medial calf as well as the skin and soft tissue of the medial ankle. So as we'll talk about in a moment, ankle surgery, when there's incisions on that medial ankle, uh, that's where we're uh, concerned about blocking the saphenous nerve for optimal analgesia there. So the second of the three nerves mentioned is the nerve to vastus medialis. Uh, and similarly, we'll talk about two different territories uh, of innervation regarding the nerve to vastus medialis, the first of which is essentially above the knee. Uh, it innervates the vastus medialis muscle itself, as the name implies. Uh, and you have to consider that to be essentially a motor nerve component. So it's important to remember that since that nerve does lie in the canal, and since it is a motor nerve, uh, although we do talk about an overall uh, minimization of quadricep weakness in just a few moments, you do have to remember there is one nerve there, the, the nerve to vastus medialis, that does have a motor component. So technically speaking, uh, there can be some degree of motor block from an adductor canal block, although clinically, as we'll mention in a moment, uh, it's probably not terribly significant. 
Uh, now, from a sensory standpoint, this is where one of those, you know, one of those uh, uh, further studies are needed. Uh, comments are 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 are, ne are welcome, uh, and that is the sensory innervation of the nerve to vastus medialis, because we always think about this nerve as primarily a motor nerve, but in fact, it actually does have some sensory innervation to the knee itself. Uh, the anterior medial articular compartment of the knee has some innervation from the nerve to vastus medialis, as does the medial synovial membrane. So, you know, we often get asked. How much importance is there in the saphenous nerve versus the nerve to vastus medialis in terms of the overall analgesia that you get from an editor canal block? The answer is I'm not entirely certain because it's actually hard to isolate those two nerves based upon the large volume studies that have been done to date. So the third of the three nerves that run in the editor canal that meant we were mentioning in a moment ago uh, is the posterior division, the posterior branch of the obturator nerve. And from an innervation standpoint, it's traditionally described as having an above the knee as well as a, a knee innervation pattern. Uh, the above the knee innervation pattern is primarily motor. Uh, it innervates basically the obturator muscles and the adductor muscles. Now from a knee standpoint, although it does have mostly sensory uh, components to it, skin of the medial knee, for example, and the medial capsule and the synovial membrane, uh, this innervation is very inconsistent. And there's really questionable uh, amount of benefit from an obturator nerve uh, in and of itself compared to the other key branches that we talk about that originate at the femoral nerve. So uh, for example, less than 40% of the time the medial skin is innervated by the, the obturator nerve uh, and it's very inconsistent exactly how much knee innervation there is in the medial capsule and the synovial membrane. So probably in my best estimation it's probably the least important of those three branches within the adductor canal. Now, we'll talk about some of the indications for the adductor canal block. And really, this is where you sort of consider the block as two different types of blocks, depending on the indication. And the first indication we'll talk about, like we mentioned earlier, is for that medial component of the calf, and, and usually the ankle, medial ankle, uh, which is where it is a considered a secondary nerve block. Now, the concept of secondary nerve block is basically that it's to be considered the second most important nerve innervating that part of the body. So, for example, for the foot and ankle, the primary nerve block, the money block, so to speak, is your sciatic nerve. Uh, and your secondary nerve, your second most important nerve providing analgesia to that area is the saphenous nerve, getting only that medial component of the calf and medial component of the ankle. So that being said, despite it being the second most important nerve, oftentimes if you have a successful sciatic block, you still need to additionally infiltrate the saphenous nerve in order to cover that medial compartment, otherwise patients can have moderate to severe pain there in that medial ankle. So we oftentimes use the saphenous nerve block in a same manner that we do the adductor canal block, which we'll talk about for knees, the same technique at that mid-thigh to give you that medial analgesia for ankle replacement surgeries, ankle fusion surgeries, or ORAFs of ankle fractures, for example, just to name a few. Now, that's the secondary nerve indications for the saphenous nerve, the more traditional saphenous nerve block slash adductor canal nerve block indications. Now, as we've learned the last several years, the adductor canal block placed the exact same way as we typically place a mid-thigh saphenous nerve block, the mid-thigh adductor canal block can also give you good analgesia, primary analgesia to the knee. Again, primary being the main nerves uh, supplying the knee. Uh, and so like we've mentioned before, ACL reconstructions in the outpatient sector uh, and total knee replacements in the inpatient sector are the two most common major knee surgeries that we utilize adductor canal blocks as an alternative to femoral nerve blocks for major knee surgery. Now, where did our interest and where did our knowledge about adductor canal blocks begin? Well, many consider this to be one of the, if not the, landmark study uh, which demonstrated a clear benefit to adductor canal blocks for major knee surgery. Uh, this study uh, was done uh, in Denmark, I believe, by Dr. Jaeger and her team, and forgive the pronunciation. Uh, it's an adductor canal block versus femoral nerve block study uh, done exclusively for total knees, and it was a nicely designed, randomized, pr uh, prospective uh, controlled trial. Uh, and basically what they looked at in two large groups, uh, all patients getting total knee replacements with spinal anesthesia as their primary anesthetic, uh, randomized to two groups. One group got a continuous adductor canal block catheter, uh, and the other group got a continuous femoral nerve block catheter. Uh, and they looked at primary as well as secondary endpoints for these patients uh, for both sensory and motor endpoints, essentially. Uh, their primary endpoints were basically strength. They were looking at quadriceps strength to see if one, femoral versus adductor canal, had a difference in the overall quadriceps strength. Now, although that was considered the primary endpoint, we kind of all expected that the motor strength would be preserved. The most interesting aspect to me of this study is comparing the analgesia that you get from a nerve block that traditionally, essentially the saphenous and nerve to vastus medialis block, plus or minus obturator posterior branch block, 
to see whether these blocks actually get good analgesia compared to a femoral nerve block. You wouldn't think on paper from what we learned traditionally in anatomy class way back when that it actually would. Uh, and so it, the outcome was actually quite surprising to a lot of us. And so basically what they did is their primary outcome, we'll talk about this first, is they looked at quadricep strength. And these are some images uh, from that study. Uh, this is the dynamometer that they're using to assess quadricep strength uh, in these patients that had either an editor canal or a femoral nerve block catheter. Uh, and looked basically at MVIC, the maximum voluntary isometric contraction uh, at 24 hours. And basically what they discovered when doing this is that the amount of quadriceps sparing was substantially better uh, for the adductor canal blocks versus the femoral nerve blocks. And although you have quadricep weakness that's due to the surgery uh, as well as the nerve block for all of these patients in both groups, the most uh, substantial uh, outcome uh, that we all recall is basically the relative sparing of the quadriceps when comparing adductor canals versus femoral. So in other words, it basically spares the quadricep versus femoral uh, and gives you a lot better strength in those quads moving forward those first few days. Now, that was sort of to be expected. The real endpoint, like I said, that I was interested in is seeing what some of these secondary endpoints were from a pain control and a narcotic consumption standpoint. And I was admittedly, when this first was presented, surprised by these outcomes. The editor canal block, in fact, had similar narcotic consumption as a femoral nerve block, uh, similar pain scores at rest and during flexion, uh, and overall, uh, a similar uh, outcome from an analgesia standpoint from femoral versus uh, editor canal block. And so this really uh, got us all thinking. This is really what's driven, I think, uh, subsequent studies. And since this study, which we won't go into details, since this study's been done, there's been a whole slew of studies that have shown very similar outcomes in various ways comparing these two blocks. But I wanted to present, at the very least, this landmark study, which got us all very excited about this technique for knees. Now, in this slide, I basically break down some of the pros and cons of the adductor canal block uh, for major knee surgery. And just going through this list one at a time here, uh, the costs slash risks on the left column there. Uh, basically, for starters, uh, you have several risks that are not unique to adductor canal blocks per se, but are just you know, unique to nerve blocks in general with local anesthetics being used. You can get local anesthesia toxicity. That toxicity can lead under worst case scenarios, although very rarely, uh, to seizure or cardiac arrest. Uh, it can lead to nerve injury. You know, you're not totally immune to nerve injury doing an adductor canal block. Uh, you can have drug reactions anytime you put local anesthetic or any drug in your body for that matter. You can have a drug reaction to that. Uh, and anytime you put a needle into the body, you can cause bleeding and or hematoma formation. Uh, and if you do a nerve block um, or a continuous catheter technique, you certainly can have infection, although again, that is also rare. Uh, now, a couple of additional points that I wanted to mention in the, in the costs, risks category uh, are that the analgesia, in my humble opinion, uh, is good, but I don't think in our experience anecdotally that it's quite as good as a femoral nerve block. But as we'll talk about, I still think it's worth doing versus a femoral nerve block, but I don't think it's quite as good. Uh, and an additional point, just as a side point, uh, since nothing's perfect, is that adductor canal blocks can certainly be harder to perform in certain patients than femoral nerve blocks. A classic example is if you have a patient who's very obese, uh, that mid-thigh location, that, that location of the adductor canal in the mid-thigh is quite a bit deeper and sometimes harder to visualize uh, than the groin location where you place a femoral catheter or a femoral block. It's much more superficial, easier to see. So this block in those circumstances can be a more challenging technique uh, than a femoral nerve block. So that's considered potentially one of the costs. Uh, I like to, like to joke, I'd rather have a, a functioning femoral nerve block that blocks both the sensation as well as the quadricep strength than a failed adductor canal block that spares both the pain and the motor <laughs> in that patient's leg, and, and in other words, makes them hurt a lot, uh, despite their quad strength being intact. So uh, I think that's just one thing to consider, uh, although as I mentioned before, uh, I still think the pros outweigh the cons for this block. Now some of these benefits, some of these pros of the adductor canal block, uh, overall the research seems to point out that adductor canal blocks do have a similar amount of analgesia, and although in our experience it hasn't quite been as good as femorals, it's still very good, and we still do it on a regular basis for, our, for our, both our outpatient and inpatient major knee surgeries. Um, the quadricep strength sparing is very real. In addition to that landmark study I mentioned, uh, there's been several additional studies, a multitude of additional studies that have showed just that same outcome, that quadriceps are spared when an adductor canal block is placed versus uh, a femoral nerve block. Uh, now, some speculate that that decreased quadricep uh, weakness in the adductor canal category might decrease your fall risk. That's although, although that's speculative and not, not clear cut, I think most would at least uh, commonsensically agree that decreasing your weakness of your quadriceps is probably overall going to decrease your likelihood of falling down, but none of us really know that for certain. That's why I have a question mark there next to that category. 
Um, what we know based upon research and experience is that your early rehabilitation, uh, your ability to ambulate early and your ability to, to satisfy uh, early rehab goals is certainly better when you have an editor canal block that spares those quads versus ephemeral nerve block. Um, an additional point about nerve injury, I mentioned of course this is not immune to nerve injury. You still have the saphenous nerve and the nerve divasus medialis in there. Uh, overall though, if you did have a catastrophic nerve injury with this type of a nerve block, it would be nowhere near as, a, as, as bad as a catastrophic femoral nerve injury. So for example, if you totally knocked out the femoral nerve, uh, which is extremely, extremely rare, I have to emphasize that point, but if you did have a major femoral nerve injury, you would have quadricep paresis, uh, and that quadricep paresis is going to lead to major debility in that patient. Most circumstances that you are concerned about when it comes to nerve injury in the editor canal would involve saphenous neuropathy. And although that can cause painful neuropathy in the medial calf, medial ankle in terms of the sensation changes, it should not cause much, if any, uh, motor weakness. And so your quadriceps should remain virtually entirely, if not entirely intact. So that's a real consideration when you're starting to avoid the worst case scenarios as best as possible. Uh, the fact that if you did have a catastrophe with an adductor canal block, it wouldn't be nearly as catastrophic as a catastrophe with a femoral nerve block. So I guess sort of the cup is half full of, way of, of choosing between two evils, I guess you could say. So another point uh, that I wanted to just mention is that surgeons and physical therapists, both in our practice and in other centers, we speak to people all over the country at the courses that we teach. Surgeons have been very happy with editor canal blocks because of that quad sparing and the good analgesia that we get. Uh, and physical therapists have been quite pleased with the ability to satisfy these early PT goals uh, that they have set for these patients. So it has been a very uh, satisfying experience from a multidisciplinary standpoint for both physicians and nurses as well as therapists, uh, surgeons and anesthesiologists alike. Everyone seems to have been happy with the outcomes we've had for adductor canal blocks for major knee surgery so far. So this is an image from uh, our website uh, that just demonstrates, I have a pen in hand, so forgive the, uh, the bare hands there, but just shows the basic location where we scan in the short axis, a cross-sectional view of the adductor canal at about the mid-thigh location. And the pen is simulating a needle here coming in from lateral to medial, or in this case, anterior to posterior is the more appropriate anatomic description and coming in several centimeters away from the probe, which allows the needle, or in this case the pen, uh, to come in at a flatter angle, which allows the needle to be better visualized by the ultrasound beam. So this is an image of a post-injection that'll happen in this particular patient, has already happened in this particular patient, at the mid-thigh location. This is the anterior side, this is the posterior side, this is a sartorius muscle in the middle of the screen here. Remember I mentioned that deep border, that bright white line of sartorius is our key landmark here. Uh, on the anterior side of the screen here is the femoral artery, deep to which and a little bit anterior to that uh, is the femoral vein, femoral artery posteriorly, excuse me, femoral vein deep and slightly anterior to the artery. And then the saphenous nerve has already got local anesthetic injected around it. That's why you see that nice contrast between that white circular nerve, that kind of honeycomb appearing nerve, and that sort of arcing black of hypoechoic local anesthetic uh, kind of over and around that saphenous nerve. That's the end point you're looking for, is to get local anesthetic just deep to that sartorius muscle, around and adjacent to that saphenous nerve, and just anterior to the femoral artery there. So this first image is just a, a depiction there of what I just mentioned, and that's some of the anatomy. Anterior, posterior, needle comes from anterior to posterior. You can see the needle a little bit there. And again, Sartorius muscle being the key muscular landmark, deep to which is the vastus medialis muscle. The posterior side contains the femoral artery here, and the saphenous nerve is the hyperechoic bright white area just deep to that sartorius muscle. And although when you're doing a mid-thigh saphenous or a mid-thigh adductor canal block, which are essentially one and the same, uh, you're ultimately, your goal is not only to visualize the deep border of sartorius and femoral artery, but also visualize the saphenous nerve, the reality is you don't always see the saphenous nerve. Just like some of these deeper total knee patients, for example, that are very obese, you may never see the saphenous nerve even after injection. So it's important to know that your endpoint you're looking for, uh, if you can't see the saphenous nerve well, is at least to get your needle tip just deep to that bright white hyperechoic horizontal line, uh, which is the deep border of the sartorius muscle. And if your local anesthetic bolus gets just deep to that sartorius muscle and just anterior to the femoral artery, you're in the correct location and you will have a very high success rate for your adductor canal blocks. Now this next loop from this single injection adductor canal block uh, is a loop that's just repeating itself. Uh, basically the needle is being redirected and popping through 
that deep border of Sartorius. Now remember when we do nerve blocks, like with any other nerve block, we're using a pencil point, kind of a blunt tip, short bevel needle. And when a short bevel needle encounters a fascial plane like the deep border of Sartorius, you can palpably feel and sometimes even see on the ultrasound image uh, a distinct pop. Uh, and when you're doing a trans-sartorial technique coming down through the sartorius muscle, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that and looking, feeling for that palpable pop as the needle gets through. That is just as important as your visualization of the needle tip getting to the correct location. Now, if you're doing a sub-sartorial approach where you're coming a little farther from your probe and coming at the adductor canal from an upwards angle, you're going to be going through the uh, a sub-sartorial approach, basically going through the vastus medialis muscle, and in that case, you'll be feeling a pop up through the superficial border of vastus medialis muscle. So one way or another, if you're popping down into the adductor canal or popping up into the adductor canal, you're feeling for that popable, uh, palpable pop sensation. Uh, and try saying that 10 times fast. So the next step I wanted to mention, sort of the final step, is the injection. And again, I have this on a loop. And once your needle is passed through the deep border of sartorius, and the tip lies just along that left side, just along that anterior side of the, of the femoral artery, you're basically looking to inject and tent up that sartorius muscle. Sometimes it's subtle, and that's why that feeling of a pop is, is important to palpate. But if you do happen to see the saphenous, as we do here, you can actually see the saphenous nerve pushed down away from the injection. Right there as the needle, as the local is injecting, you can see it actually pushed down away from the injection. Uh, and you can oftentimes see the, the, the vastus medialis muscle actually pushing down away. In, a, in essence, you're trying to fill that compartment, trying to see black anechoic local anesthetic fill that compartment with the superficial muscle, the sartorius tenting upwards, and the deep muscle, the vastus medialis tenting downwards. And it's something that you get in the habit of seeing over time. It's not your typical nerve block in the sense that you don't always see that saphenous nerve. So you're not always looking for a nice donut around a nerve. Instead, you're looking for the way the muscles in the artery change uh, as you inject. Oftentimes, that femoral artery will push away, posterior away from the injection. Now, as far as the local anesthesia volume, I'll just touch on this briefly. Uh, local anesthetic uh, being injected in the adductor canal exclusively for the saphenous nerve, so for example, in the medial ankle uh, uh, indication, uh, you really don't need a whole lot of volume. If you're in the correct location, we only use usually up to about five cc's, maybe 10 cc's if we're in doubt that the local is getting in the correct location. For the adductor canal, since you're spreading to several nerve branches, uh, most of us believe that you do need to bump up your volume to some degree. And at the very least, it's probably worth putting 10 cc's in. Now, there's a lot of studies putting in 30 cc's, and we actually clinically don't think that a total of 30 cc's is necessary. So I think typically for an adductor canal, for a knee, we'll usually advocate somewhere in the 10 to 20 cc range. Uh, it really just depends how well you're visualizing that local anesthetic spreading within the canal. So that's a couple of uh, video clips from a single injection adductor canal block. Now, the times that we use the single injection adductor canal block uh, are for medial ankle pain for, for foot and ankle surgery uh, so that we can numb that saphenous nerve. Uh, or for knee surgeries, we'll sometimes rescue uh, severe pain in the recovery room with a rescue adductor canal block after knee arthroscopy. So those are scenarios where we'll commonly use single injection nerve blocks. Uh, rather. For the more major knee surgeries like total knee replacements and adductor, uh, excuse me, uh, ACL reconstructions, uh, we'll more commonly put continuous catheters in. And the reason is simple. Single injection nerve blocks, even if you add all the additives in the world, your epinephrine, your clonidine, your dexamethasone, uh, on and off label additives to local anesthetics, you usually can't get it to last much more than 12 to 18 hours maybe 24 hours at the most. And everybody knows that these major knee surgeries, their pain lasts a lot longer than that 24 hour mark. And so by placing a continuous perineural catheter, uh, we can actually extend the duration of that pain relief up to several days. And we won't go into any of the research data because uh, in the interest of time, but I did just give you a shortened URL here, bit.ly forward slash Bingham dash catheter dash review. Uh, which is a nice uh, meta-analysis looking at all the data comparing single injection nerve blocks to continuous catheter techniques. Uh, so that's the basis of our decisions to place catheters on a regular basis. So a couple of loops from our adductor canal catheter technique. Uh, and I'll pause this for just a moment just to point out that what we're going to show you is an oblique technique. Basically, when you're threading a catheter, one of your things you're always concerned about is that you want to place your catheter next to the target nerves or, or canal in this case, uh, but you also want it to stay where you leave the catheter. Uh, and we found in our experiences, and in my experiences in particular, uh, that when I thread the catheter a few centimeters down the canal, parallel to the nerves and vessels within the canal, that it's more likely to stay in place, less likely to dislodge that way. So what I'm going to show you is an oblique technique, basically that still takes an in-plane view of your needle 
uh, but we rotate it about 45 degrees so that your needle is more angled down the canal, more, uh, more, more allowing um, of, the, of the catheter to exit the needle when it comes time to thread the catheter and thread down the canal, essentially railroad or float down the canal post-injection uh, and therefore allow you to leave a few centimeters of catheter parallel to the saphenous nerve, parallel to the femoral artery, and parallel to the nerve structures within that adductor canal that are important for knee analgesia. Um, so that's the aside there just regarding the technique. It will be an oblique technique, and I'll point out some of those steps in a moment. But first and foremost, just like with any other continuous catheter technique, we do a wide chlorhexidine prep to clean the skin prior to, to beginning. Now you can see the drape here. It has a nice little orifice there. Uh, that's going to be basically our sterile field. We're going to place the sticky drape, which is all around the orifice there, on the insertion site of the needle. Uh, and as we'll show you in a moment, uh, as we place this drape here, we place the circular, circular opening of that drape on the place where the needle is going to be inserted. And we'll show you in a moment that the probe is actually going to be handed to me. I put a little sterile ultrasound gel on the transducer. This is an HFL50 high frequency linear transducer. Uh, and we have our nurse hand us the probe so that the probe is basically on the non-sterile field. We're actually able to reach through the sterile plastic, the drape that comes in our catheter trays, and hold the probe with our offhand, with our lead hand, hold the probe through the sterile plastic. This is a technique that allows us to keep a separate field with our sterile field where our needle's inserted and our non-sterile field where our probe is being held and allows us to avoid avoids the need for a, a probe cover to be placed on the ultrasound transducer, which is a cost containment item, uh, but also a time consideration. It takes time to place the ultrasound probe cover on and to take it off at the end. So a little bit of save money, a little bit of save time there. So we'll point out some of the anatomic landmarks here. Uh, the ultrasound still image here is basically me scanning uh, and placing the needle eventually in the anterior to posterior direction from right to left on this screen. Uh, and what we're showing you here is just a repeating loop uh, showing you anterior here, posterior here, showing you the main landmarks as we mentioned before, the femoral artery here, the sartorius muscle superficial to that femoral artery running from posterior to anterior, the deep order of sartorius which is that bright white horizontal line running across the deep portion of that muscle the vastus medialis muscle, which runs deep to the stertorius muscle here, which is one of the other boundaries of the adductor canal. Uh, and then ultimately notice that I'm relaxing my probe pressure. I wanted to point this out, uh, that with this and many other nerve blocks, it's important, although that you do visualize things better oftentimes with a nice firm amount of probe pressure, uh, it's important intermittently to relax the pressure you're putting on the probe. The P, remember, is one of the part maneuvers uh, for manipulating your ultrasound transducer. Uh, now when we relax the probe here, as you can see in this loop, as we relax, you see some veins right there kind of come out of hiding, so to speak. When we hold firm pressure, we don't see the veins as well, and you have to be careful because sometimes veins are in the path of your expected needle trajectory, uh, and if you don't see the veins as you're going in, you may accidentally hit them and cause a hematoma. So intermittently, the lesson there is intermittently relax your transducer pressure so that you could see any veins that may be hiding in the path. And in this case, since we're coming from right to left, the femoral veins here are not in the path of our needle because this is our target. The anterior space, the adductor canal, which lies just to the right of, just anterior to the femoral artery, just deep to the sartorius muscle, and just superficial to the vastus medialis muscle. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to take our probe and rotate it 45 degrees. So I'll back this up here. You can see this is our starting position. We've rolled down the, uh, the ACE bandage here, because remember this is being placed in the post-operative setting. Uh, we've rolled the bandage down and we're starting in a true short axis cross-sectional view with our transducer. But remember, we want our catheter eventually to be threaded parallel down the adductor canal. So to facilitate that, as you'll see here, the probe is simply rotated 45 degrees so that an in-plane needle insertion is now going to take essentially a diagonal angle to the thigh. Uh, what that allows us to do is when the catheter threads out of that needle, it's more likely to thread down the canal than if it was truly perpendicular to the canal. So this obliqueness is going to allow us to thread that catheter out of the canal. And as we'll show you in a little bit, once it comes time to thread the catheter, once the bolus is injected through the needle, uh, what we'll do is the TUI, which has kind of a curved tip, will actually start with the TUI facing upwards, facing towards the probe, uh, towards the medial side. We'll actually turn the TUI to the left 90 degrees. Uh, such that the bevel angle is actually, t is actually rotated down the canal as well. So we've already got a 45 degree angle with our needle. Now our TUI bevel is actually rotated down. And once that canal is filled with local anesthetic, it's going to be a lot easier to thread that catheter a few centimeters down the adductor canal. 
And this is how that looks in an ultrasound. So we've now rotated our transducer and see the only real difference is that that artery becomes a little bit more oblong, becomes a little more of an oblique view of that artery. I'll quickly skip back to the starting view. Notice the artery is circular. This is a true transverse cross-section, short axis view of the artery uh, with sartorius here and vastus medialis muscle here with the adductor canal here. And if I play that as the transducer is being rotated, notice that the artery is actually going to elongate a little bit. So you notice that and it's, it's something you can appreciate, but it's not a real game changer. It really doesn't change our imaging that much. So actually by rotating our probe 90, uh, 45 degrees, we still have that nice deep border of bright white hyperechoic uh, sartorius muscle. We still have the hyperechoic collection of nerves in the adductor canal. Uh, and we still have a good arterial landmark to uh, stay anterior to, uh, to tell us that we're in the right location. So it's sort of a win-win here. It's gonna help, our th help us thread our catheter uh, without the cost of actually worsening our image as we rotate the probe. So we're gonna place an 18 gauge stimulating needle in from in plane uh, from anterior to posterior with, again, an oblique angulation down the thigh. Uh, now, I just do want to mention uh, that this needle is stimulating. And the reason I want to mention that is that although this is primarily a sensory block, it's primarily the saphenous nerve that we're targeting when we're looking for our endpoint just anterior to that femoral artery. Um, that being said, uh, the nerve to vastus medialis is in there, and so it's possible that you'll encounter the nerve to vastus medialis as you're doing this nerve block. Uh, and if you encountered that with your stimulating needle, you would actually see a, a quadricep twitch on the medial quadricep, the vastus medialis muscle, uh, which lies on that medial side of the thigh all the way down to the knee. And so if you encounter that twitch, you of course don't want to continue on through that nerve. So it can be a safety measure to have your stimulating needle on in the event that you encounter this, the vastus medialis twitch, either at the expected location within the adductor canal or sometimes at an unexpected location. And I do want to take a moment just to touch on that. Let me go back a slide here for a second. Uh, this view, and I won't even press play, this view, this still image, the sartorius, where it meets the vastus medialis, anterior, uh, posterior is the femoral artery, this plane between those two muscles, typically the saphenous nerve very consistently at the mid-thigh location lies here. The nerve to vastus medialis actually varies quite a bit, and as you go higher up the thigh, the nerve to vastus medialis is, tends to join and, and run in parallel with the saphenous nerve at that location, just anterior to the artery, but the farther down the thigh that you go, the more we actually see the nerve to vastus medialis migrate along that canal, or along that space, excuse me, between the two muscles. And oftentimes with a stimulating needle, you'll inadvertently or expectedly, if you saw it with ultrasound, get a vastus medialis twitch way out here as, as your needle is coming in from anterior to posterior towards the target. Uh, so again, from a safety standpoint, I think it's a wise idea to have your stimulating needle on to be able to avoid that twitch uh, in the event that you encounter the nerve to vastus medialis where you expect to, or in the event that you encounter it out here where it often lies between sartorius and vastus medialis, or as just happened the other day, you sometimes encounter the nerve to vastus medialis within the belly of the, of the vastus medialis muscle if you're taking a subsartorial approach through the vastus medialis muscle. So uh, although you can very successfully place an adductor canal block with ultrasound without ner using a nerve stimulation at all uh, from a success standpoint, at least from a safety standpoint, we believe, I believe at least, uh, that a dual guidance technique with both ultrasound and nerve stimulation is a wise choice. So we'll skip here now to the injection. So our needle is now coming in from anterior to posterior. It's coming transartorially through the sartorius muscle. And as it approaches the adductor canal here, this deep border sartorius, we steepen our needle angle a little bit and feel a distinct pop as we're getting through that muscle. And you can actually see a little rebound oftentimes. And what we're going to do is inject in 5 cc aliquots, local anesthetic, starting there. And right as I start injecting, you can actually see that canal opening up. And our nurse has aspirating every few cc's and injecting up to a total of 10 to 20 cc's. In this particular instance, we gave 15 cc's total. And as you can see at the end, uh, and I'll flash forward from the beginning, where you don't see that space opened up between sartorius and vastus medialis. It's basically a potential space there. You see not really much black there. You compare that to our post-injection view as I fast forward here. You can see a lot of black local anesthetic along and around uh, that canal. All this black is now local anesthetic filling that canal. And that's the endpoint you're looking for. Now, in this particular instance, and this was helped by our HFL50 probe, uh, which is typically our probe of choice uh, for most of the blocks that we do. Uh, although with this particular patient, you see a nice, bright, hyperechoic saphenous nerve, and of course that makes it easier. 
Like I said before, you don't always see that saphenous nerve. And so if you don't see your saphenous nerve clearly, your next best surrogate for being in the correct location is to see a nice well of black local anesthetic, anechoic, hypoechoic, black local anesthetic in that space between sartorius and vastus medialis muscle. And if you were doing a single injection nerve block, that's your endpoint. You complete your job there. For a catheter technique, though, uh, what we'll do is we'll disconnect our tubing and thread our catheter, as that image just shows there. I'll go back to that for a second. We'll thread our catheter until it gets to about the tip of the bevel of the TUI needle. And I'll pause again. At this location, the TUI tip is right here. It's just deep to the saphenous nerve. And our TUI bevel, as I initially mentioned, which starts facing upwards, the bevel initially faces towards the beam up this direction. We'll rotate the bevel 90 degrees, in this case 90 degrees left, 90 degrees down the adder canal. It'll be 90 degrees to the left, such that, that that curved bevel will help aid that catheter threading down the canal. And when we go to thread the catheter, as you can see in the bottom left, I'm advancing the catheter as we speak here. Uh, as we go to thread that catheter, it should be a minimal amount of resistance as it floats down that canal. Now, if you start to have any significant degree of resistance, you have to assume that that catheter is bunching up on itself, and we have to assume that that's probably going to have more likelihood of dislodging. So ideally, we want that catheter to sort of railroad or float down that adductor canal uh, four to five centimeters or so. Now, I'll pause this again. So to confirm, uh, we do several things. So many people, and I don't blame them for this, you know, you're in a hurry. A lot of people don't do a confirmational injection. And the reality is confirming the tip location of your catheter isn't always fruitful. Most times it's not going to change anything. What the reason you're doing it uh, with ultrasound is basically to confirm if in fact your catheter tip is where you thought it was. Um, you know, 95 plus out of 100 times, you're not going to do anything because your catheter is going to be exactly where you expect it to be. But there's those couple out of 100, those patients aren't going to be very happy if you leave a catheter in the incorrect location without having tested it. So we're perfectionists. We want to have all of our catheters work. So we test each and every one of our catheters. Uh, there's two benefits, really, to testing that catheter. Uh, three, I guess, if you consider aspiration negative uh, for heme, uh, making sure you're not in a blood vessel. Uh, the two additional benefits, in addition to confirming that the catheter tip is in the correct location, uh, the third benefit is with a little epinephrine mixed into your local anesthetic, it acts like an epidural test dose. Basically, you're, you're trying to avoid uh, the possibility that your catheter has migrated intervascularly, uh, which you would see uh, some patients uh, altered sensorium, they'd feel lightheaded, you'd feel, see tachycardia on the, on the, on the EKG monitor. Uh, and again, you should have an EKG monitor uh, for all of your nerve blocks. Uh, I've had that discussion recently, uh, blood pressure, pulse ox, EKG. Uh, you may see some EKG changes, including tachycardia from your epinephrine. So you definitely want to mix in local anesthetic with epinephrine. Uh, usually in our case, we'll mix three cc's in. And in addition to the tachycardia that you want to avoid, in addition to the negative aspiration, from an ultrasound standpoint, basically what we're looking for is a visualization of the spread of the catheter tip uh, where we think it should be. And so... As I, as I advance this video here, you can see that the catheter tip should be right about here, just under the, under the nerve. Uh, and I'll mention also, now you may have to go full screen to see this, but our probe is being viewed. Now you may have already noticed that the artery looks circular. We're no longer getting an oblique view with our ultrasound transducer. We've actually rotated it back 45 degrees, so it's a true short axis, true cross-sectional view because the target's going to look more like we want it to look uh, with that view. Uh, in addition to rotating 45 degrees back to a short axis uh, view, our nurse has actually slid the probe down the thigh about five to eight centimeters, such that from the location where the needle's going into the skin, such that we're trying to identify where that catheter tip has, has threaded down to. If you put the probe right next to where the needle insertion is, well, your tip's gonna be way down the thigh and you're probably not going to visualize your, your test dose. So we've actually churned to a short axis view and slid down the thigh about five to eight centimeters. So I'll press play again here. And we're just looking for movement in that adductor canal to prove that we've actually got in the right location. And there's our injection going in. And although subtle, you can see that saphenous nerve moving away from the injection. And you can see some anechoic black local anesthetic sort of filling that canal a little bit more like a burst with that injection. And I'll play that once more just to show you the subtlety of that bolus. Keep an eye on that little location a little bit of a burst there, a little bit of movement. Now, I've looked at hundreds of these, uh, if not thousands of these, and I can tell that that is a successful endpoint. But uh, you may not get as good of a view of your injection. You may not visualize anything with your testos, in which case it's probably wise to have a backup plan uh, for visualization. 
And, and that backup plan, which we exercise often, uh, if you're not injecting, lo if you're injecting local anesthetic as a test dose and you don't see the movement there, you may consider adding a half of cc of air. Air is hyperechoic, very reflective, and may be the difference maker in you visualizing the catheter tip or not. And so in this case, since that last injection was somewhat subtle, we've now added uh, half a cc of air to our syringe, uh, and basically you'll see the plunger will actually be turned downward so that the air all travels to the top of the syringe as we inject, and we'll look for bright white hyperechoic spread of air uh, in that canal now. So in a few seconds here, I'll turn the plunger up, plunger down, excuse me, and the air injects there. You can see that burst of air there, which is our final confirmation that we are, in fact, in the correct location. If I see that, if I see a nice, bright, hyperechoic nerve, very crisp, clear, deep border of sartorius next to the uh, artery, and I see a bright, hyperechoic burst next to or deep to that saphenous nerve, I am very happy because I know that this catheter uh, is in the correct location, and since we identified it five to eight centimeters distal to where the needle was initially inserted, we know that we have a several centimeters of catheter within that canal that should prevent dislodgement when the quadriceps flex and extend and the legs uh, hyperextend and, and flex, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of frictional forces that go on with all of those movements that can potentially lead to internal dislodgement of your catheter. So having that catheter a few centimeters in the canal, I think improves your likelihood of success. Now, it's just as important to do these final couple of steps as the initial steps. Placing the dressing is very important. Don't, don't skimp on this step. And after you widely clean all the ultrasound gel off, uh, you saw there I was using Mastisol widely, which is a skin adhesive. And now I'm going to use our filter straw to just have our nurse drop a few drops of Histocryl skin sealant onto the insertion site. And there's several skin sealants available. They're all essentially uh, very, very similarly effective at sealing the hole. This prevents leakage of the local anesthetic back at the skin. So you want to use some type of a skin sealant. We put a few steri strips on in sort of a star pattern. And then lastly, put a wide, uh, a large clear plastic tagaderm dressing over the entire insertion site. Roll back our gauze bandage back on top of the dressing a little bit where it started. And we are done with our continuous catheter technique and can expect great analgesia for the next several days as opposed to the 18 hours or so that you'll get from a single injection nerve block. So just to summarize what we've talked about, we've covered a lot today. We've covered the anatomy of the adductor canal. Uh, we've talked about the indications for the adductor canal block, both the secondary indications down at the foot and ankle on the medial side, uh, as well as the primary indications for major knee surgery as an alternative to femoral nerve blocks and femoral nerve catheters. Uh, we talked about the evidence, primarily presenting the evidence that has been uh, explained in the landmark study comparing femoral nerve blocks to adductor canal catheters for both sensory pain control as well as quadriceps sparing. Uh, and we also gave you a nice link to a meta-analysis comparing single injection nerve blocks to continuous catheter techniques in general. Uh, and then lastly, we talked about the techniques. We showed you some various tips and tricks by way of video clips from our Sonocyte S-Nerve, uh, showing techniques for single injection nerve blocks, uh, as well as the step-by-step -step technique for a continuous catheter technique using an oblique approach. Uh, and I hope that was all helpful. Um, before we conclude today, um, before we ask or answer some questions from the audience, uh, I just wanted to say a few thank yous. Uh, I wanted to thank Jimmy Sims in the back, who has uh, diligently and patiently uh, waited for me to get all this set up today. Uh, and I'm very appreciative uh, for the opportunity to do uh, webinars and filmings like this at the Andrews Institute. It's one of many, many perks to working here. Uh, I also want to thank the folks at Fujifilm and Sonocyte, uh, Ted and Jody in particular. Uh, they were instrumental in getting this webinar set up today. Uh, I want to thank my wife, who is always extremely supportive of me, both personally and professionally. Uh, Emily, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in and watching. As I understand, there's people watching today from all over the country and, and in fact, all over the world, not just nurses and doctors, not just anesthesiologists, but other specialties as well. So I hope not just the perioperative teams that are watching were, were benefited from this, but I hope some of the multi-specialty folks that are watching got a thing or two, uh, tip, or, tip or trick, uh, a few tips and tricks up your sleeve as well after watching this. So uh, I'll turn the floor back over to the folks uh, from Sonocyte, and I thank you all for watching.